Well, this is another irony. Everybody at the Supreme Court can define what religion is. Hmm. <laughs> um, I'm conscious over time here, we have, I wanted, of course, to get the LGBT rights and a couple of other questions, but I think our audience might do that for us, and we'll let them guide us in that, that part of the questioning with an apology that we weren't able to get to it uh, more directly here. Mm -hmm. So our, our speakers have agreed uh, for a period of question and answers, and I'm happy to, to take questions if you have some. Um, in the back, yes. Um, in the mask mandate, does that apply to all speakers from professors? Shouldn't they be wearing masks right now? I can't do that. Like I don't know we should be wearing masks, and, and we decided there was enough of a gap that was better mm -hmm. to be able to hear us. And at least one of us has a bit of a hearing. I don't remember that being an exemption that we're allowed to make that choice. It is not. Yes, get in front. Is it inevitable that the conflict, that the legal conflict over the free exercise clause increases over time given the increased government, role of government, government regulation, or, or not? It, it was Professor Lehoff said, is that not inevitable if many exceptions are non controversial I just wonder how your thoughts on that. Well, you certainly put your finger on a key part of the problem. Um, as compared to the founding, when more than 99% of the population was Protestant and agreement on morality was pretty widespread and regulation was quite limited, um, you know, none of that is true today. We have enormous religious diversity, moral disagreement, and uh, much more intense government regulation. So yes, that's where many of the conflicts come from. Um, We've granted exemptions politically throughout the nation's history, uh, including at the founding. We've granted them judicially on occasion with nowhere near the entire history of the country. Um, you know, we can still work these things out, but you're right that much of the source of controversy is increased regulation and an increased sense of rights and entitlements on, on both sides. A greater sense of entitlement on religious folks and, and a greater sense of entitlement on the part of people with countervailing views on important moral and other issues. I would just elaborate a little on that answer by pointing out that the government uh, has been doing so much more in recent years than what used to be done in the private sector. So the area of conflict between the, uh, the activities of the government and the activities of the religion is uh, many, many times what it was when I was growing up in the law 60 years ago. It's a different, different society we live in. We're talking about one aspect of what has happened in the growth of government in controlling education and a lot of other things that the government used to be distant from. And that creates greater areas for conflict with Religion, depending on what the religion sees as its role in teaching its members and in doing with their contributions and support what it has done historically. Have you heard that? Yeah, this is for Dale. So in 2019, you said in that quote, we are confronted by a culture of evil and personal witness in the world, and this includes the interesting power and phenomenon of lesbian, gay, and transgender lifestyle. Could could you read that again? My hearing is not very good after my forthcoming ninety. Yeah, just to be a little louder. Yeah, yeah I want to hear your question. So in June 2019, you said at a conference at BYU Hawaii, you said, and I quote, "We are confronted by a culture of evil and personal wickedness in the world. This includes the increasing power and phenomenon." of lesbian, gay, and transgender lifestyle and balance. So I have two questions for you. What have you done to be more progressive since that time, since 2019, to the LGBT community? And what have you done to address some of the things that you've done in the past, including the things that you said, and overseeing the enforcement of electric shock and vomiting conversion therapy for LGBT students at the Let me say about electric shock treatments at BYU, I became president of BYU. That had been discontinued earlier and it never went on under my administration. Put that to one side. Let me begin to uh, 
try to answer your question from the Hawaii uh, remarks, uh, bear in mind that my audience there was an audience of Latter-day Saints. Mm -hmm. I have responsibilities when I teach people who follow Latter-day Saint doctrine than I have when I speak as a representative of the church on what positions the church ought to take in society as a whole. And so, uh, I think the, the correct answer to your question, the accurate answer to your question is, uh, number one, I understand uh, better the situation of the church in relating to society now than I did then. Partly by working on the lecture that I'll give tonight. I refer you to that lecture for part of the answer to your question. The other part is asking you to understand that the church has its unique doctrines. It does not try to make rules for all society, but we do make rules and set limits for our own membership. And they're uh, responsible either to receive that teaching or not. Uh, but don't judge a public, or don't judge a private sermon by public issues. Okay. Have a lot of time now. Um, yes, you have a vote back, Scott. Uh, yeah, thank you. The question is also for Dalla. I'm curious if following Bob Jones and our understanding of the religious exemptions for race in this country, how do you fit? with your sort of Utah compromise and the list of the reference in this talk. And the religious exemptions to LGBTQIA individuals, what stops that from saying we should have, if a particular religion, for example, wants to discriminate against Jewish students or enforce electroshock conversion on Jewish students, why should we have to May I interrupt you and say, I'm only getting about half of what you say. Michael, can you mute? Can you restate the question for us? Yeah, I'm gonna, do you want me to try, um, or do you want to come forward and just be a little louder? Sure, I can come forward. Yeah, just to be, just, just so we can hear you, it's a little hard to hear. <laughs> yes, I hear you much better. This question is for you. I'm curious, following Bob Jones and the understanding of religious exemptions for race in this country, how does that fit with your framework of the Utah Compromise that you mentioned earlier? And what, for example, would stop a religion that decided to discriminate against Jewish people from meriting a religious exemption to exclude Jewish students or to convert uh, to enact conversion therapy or electric shock conversion therapy on Jewish students? I confess that I've never thought that the Utah Compromise had anything to do with the Bob Jones case or with the, the, the inner values of Jewish students. I, I, I'd like to answer your question, but I can't understand the issue. Well, let me, let me take a try. So, for those who don't know, Bob Jones was a case in the 80s um, that upheld uh, the IRS refusing tax exemptions to nonprofit schools uh, that refused to admit black students. Uh, and they rejected a religious liberty claim in a paragraph that said there's an obvious compelling interest in equal access to education. That was in the Deep South, and it was when uh, these interviews were still at very much an issue, and white flight to private schools was, was a significant problem. Uh, but Bob Jones is not a case that upholds an exception or, or encourages an exception. So the Utah Compromise is a statute that bans uh, discrimination on the basis of sexual orientation in uh, housing or employment in Utah, um, one of the reddest states in the country. Um, uh, it did not address the public accommodations issue. Uh, and, uh, and, and from the gay rights perspective, the political price was pretty broad exemptions for religious institutions. Um, those exemptions protect religious institutions in running their own uh, operations in accordance with their own faith. Um, could there be some extreme abuse of those? Uh, yes. Um, I don't think there are exemptions in that bill to religious discrimination, but President Oates would know better. Um, but in theory, yeah, there, there could be. Um, 
many exceptions would be used wisely, some exceptions not so much. Uh, I would like to see all the conservative churches change their teachings on sex, but it's not my business. I'm not a member of one of those churches. I have no voice, and I should not have a voice. Um, so uh, yeah, the exemption issue is not about authorizing discrimination in general. It is about um, whether uh, certain institutions can uh, uh, have exceptions to run by their own values. And without those exceptions, there would be no protection whatever for gay rights in Utah. Utah would be like Alabama. It would be impossible to pass a gay rights law. Uh, let me just add to, to that. I'll speak about the Utah Fairness for All legislation in my lecture tonight and may uh, supplement what the Professor Laycock has said, but I think for present purposes of that, that's all that uh, I can That's another idea. That, that's another idea. <laughs> I think we have uh, time for one more question. Yes. So this is directed at Dalai Jokes. You mentioned uh, in your response to the Hawaiian question a distinction between uh, life in the private sphere or in a church sphere and life in the public sphere. And in relation to that distinction, my question is, do you think there is a way to be both a proponent of religious liberty and a proponent of the rights of other minorities like the LGBTQ community and if you can be a proponent of both, does it depend on that distinction between a private and a public sphere? The, uh, the distinction is a sound one. It's really a constitutional distinction. But the answer to your basic question is yes, and I'll talk about that in my lecture tonight. <laughs> <laughs> Could you give us a secret study lecture? I don't think many of us will be able to attend tonight to that. Uh, I think the solution to that is for people on one side to become better acquainted and have more respect and knowledge for the people on the other side. And that's a principle that applies to both sides. And finally, the Utah Compromise, so-called, seen in that light is a, a small step toward that. And there are several other steps that I outline, uh, and, and I can't do 30 minutes worth in 60 seconds, but basically, I think we've got to live together. We need each other by we, I mean this side and that side. We need each other. We've got to learn how to live with each other. And the, the way to do that is to not to take hardline positions that we have to prevail in every contest between non-discrimination and religious freedom, that, that there's room to, to uh, make compromises and accommodations and better understanding. That, that's the best summary I can give for tonight. And may I just add, we'll be live streaming that talk on, on the Mormon Studies YouTube channel tonight, if you're not able to get into the rotunda.